Several years ago, there appeared on Broadway a political satire called Of Thee I Sing. It could well appear again in 2008. Opening scene of that uh, musical took place in a smoke-filled hotel room. A group of what we might call superdelegates had gathered. And they had chosen a man to represent them, and uh, now they were looking for a platform on which he could campaign. They had all kinds of suggestions. And then one of the delegates, uh, looking at a chambermaid who was there to clean up the room, saw her as a kind of ordinary person, and he asked her, what do you think the people of the country want? And she responded, love. Everybody wants love. <laughs> and love became the major plank of the platform. Not so outlandish, compares to hope, or change, or integrity, or truth all of which become part of campaign literature. Now, love is, uh, could be well used today. It's up there with hot dogs and baseball, Toyotas, shopping at the mall. Sometimes I think when we look at the New Testament, if we think about it at all, we have the sense that the apostles, the writers of the New Testament, got together in a church council that hasn't been numbered, and they did, wanted to get a message that would be very user-friendly. And somebody suggested, how about love? And they adopted it. And all of the apostles who did the writing stayed on message, again and again. We are told that we are to be people of love. Can't quarrel with that. That's a good platform. Until you get down to examining what you mean by love. In some cases, the devil is in the details. In the New Testament, God is in the details. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this passage we have been studying together for a number of weeks, after having established that love is essential for Christian ministry, for Christian service and sacrifice, Paul takes a stab at uh, defining love in verses uh, 4 through 7. He's going to tell us what love is by showing us what love does. He's going to define love by describing love. And as we have seen, there are uh, 15 different phrases that the apostle uses to show us love in action. Uh, first two, love is patient, love is kind, is a, well, a kind of a headline for what follows. And then there are eight things that love doesn't do. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud. And then he concludes with five things that love does do. Five things that characterize a person who really loves God and people. It uh, rejoices wherever truth is found. It always protects. It's in constant trust in God. And then Paul says that this uh, love of which he speaks, love always hopes. <laughs> the ancient world was devoid of hope. It's interesting, I think, that in Acts chapter 16, where Paul makes a great turn in his ministry, he is over in Turkey, up in Troas, and he gets a vision of a man from Macedonia. And the man pleads with him in this vision to come and help us. <laughs> if there was a culture in the ancient world that didn't need help, it was the Greek culture. They had everything. They had philosophers. They had uh, Plato and Aristotle and Isocrates. They had orators, <laughs> uh, men who could travel across the Greek culture and hold people spellbound. They had architecture. 
Today, we visit the Parthenon, that magnificent uh, temple built over 2,000 years ago. And still, it astounds us. They had uh, amusement. They had the arts. There were the plays of uh, Sophocles and Euripides. They had sports. Virtually every city had a stadium in which uh, people competed. And in a few months, we will see the games in Beijing, which go back to ancient Greece. One classical historian says of the Greeks that anything the Greeks needed, they had invented. Anything that they wanted, they had. But he was wrong. There was one thing they did not have. They did not have hope. Because they did not have hope, they gave themselves to all kinds of sensual indulgences. It's true of that culture. It's true of our own. Matthew Arnold, the historian, put it this way. On that sad pagan world, disgust and secret loathing fell. Deep weariness and sated lust made human life a hell. As Paul said, they were without God and they were without hope. And if there was one city in Greece that typified the hopeless condition of the people, the city of Corinth. Great throbbing city, commercial center, uh, surrounded by two great uh, seas. Ships came to it from all parts of the world. At the center of the city, there was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, goddess of fertility, goddess of sexual love. We are told that at one time in Aphrodite's history, she had between 5,000 and 10,000 temple prostitutes to do her bidding. You can be sure with women doing personal work, those sailors became easy converts, converts to that religion. People who were moral people despised Corinth. If you said that somebody was a Corinthian, you meant he was totally debauched. You said that someone was a Corinthian drinker, you meant that he or she was an unrestrained alcoholic. Whenever you turn over a rock, you see those slimy creatures that appear. And that was the whole culture of Corinth. Thieves, robbers, homosexuals, idolaters. It was moral darkness without hope. And then one day, a little Jew from Tarsus, Tarsus showed up in the marketplace. By his own admission, he felt very weak. He said he was afraid. He trembled to speak into that darkness, this word of hope. <laughs> but he did. At first, I'm sure the Corinthians listened to him and walked away and mocked. And later, some others came and heard. And and they heard him, but then went back to their prostitutes and to their wineskins. But then some came perhaps to laugh, but stayed to listen. And this message that this little Jew preached, Jesus Christ and him crucified, his person, his work, somehow grabbed hold of them. 
And they cast themselves with a reckless abandon upon God's truth and grace. And they were changed. Listen to how Paul expresses that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, you know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Don't be deceived. Neither the uh, sexually immoral or idolaters or adulterers or male prostitutes or homosexual offenders thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. These folks had been filthy. And now, because of Paul's gospel by God's Spirit, they were clean. These folks had been unholy. Now they were set apart to God. They were wicked. And because of the gospel Paul preached, the judge of all the universe had declared that they were righteous. They were changed. Paul's hope was not based on wishful thinking. You know, hope for the best, but expect the worst. Wishful thinking doesn't work. You know wishful thinking. A woman has a son and goes off to swim in a cesspool. Turns his back upon her, on his values. His mother says, but Henry is such a good boy and I'm sure that Henry will turn out all right. His friends know Henry. He's uh, stolen from them. The drugs. The police know Henry. They've got several file folders on him. Now, if that mother thinks that Henry has the potential to really turn his life around and be a, a whole new person, it's cute. But it's not hope. There's nothing in Henry that will make the difference. But the gospel, the gospel comes to men and to women. It came to the people in Corinth, came to people in the ancient world. It comes to people today. And when they come to embrace the gospel, the person, the work of Jesus Christ, They are changed. The filthy are cleansed. The unholy are set apart to God. The wicked are declared righteous. Whenever you see a woman or a man, no matter who they are, don't ever dismiss them as hopeless. If you are someone who takes the gospel of Jesus Christ seriously, to say that somebody is hopeless is to slam the door in the face of God. This love of which Paul speaks always hopes because it's based in Jesus Christ. And then he says, uh, love endures. I speak honestly, I hardly know how to touch this. So 
several years ago, Bruce Walkie and I uh, led a tour of Turkey, churches in the Revelation. And the last night we were in the uh, city of Izmir and we were having dinner at one of its uh, nicer hotels. Uh, Bruce was there, I was there, our guide was there. The guide had been in the United States at least 10 years, spoke English flawlessly. And as we were eating, he began to ask us questions, serious questions about the Christian faith. I, I said to him, you know, if you're follower of Islam, if, uh, you know, you died tonight, would you be sure you could stand in the presence of Allah? You know, <laughs> five things that uh, Muslims should do. I said, I've done two out of five. And then we began to talk the gospel. We talked about it long into the night. They closed the restaurant when we left. And before we left, I said to him, uh, look, uh, you, this, you're serious about our conversation, I know. I, it would not be faithful of me not to ask you if, if right now you'd like to put your trust and confidence in Jesus Christ. He said to me, you don't know what you're asking me. <laughs> Ask it. Put your trust, your confidence in Christ. He said, do you know what would happen if uh, I did that? If I announced it to anybody, if my wife would leave me, my family would disown me, my boss would fire me, I might want to leave to go back to the United States and the government would not give me an exit. He said, <laughs> I'd give up everything. You go back home tomorrow. I would not expect that you would support me. And I would starve to death in my own culture. As far as I know, he did not trust Christ that night. But there are people who have made that decision and suffered all of that loss and endured hardship because they are Christ's followers. If you think that Romans 8.28, all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purposes, is a promise that you'll have a middle class life in a kind of a lovely little church in a nice little town where you may even get a pass to the country club. Paul did not make that promise. In fact, when you look at the apostle who wrote these words and he tells us about what he suffered, it's, it's a terrible list. He says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I have been flogged more severely. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in dangers in the city, endangered in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled. I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. 
and have often gone without food and I have been cold and naked. When they whipped him, he bled. When they stoned him, he groaned. When he was exposed to the elements, he froze. You say, how did he do it? Why did he do it? Look at the church today. We hear it, and it's a nice statistic that more people were martyred for the faith in the last century than all the other centuries combined. It's also true that there are more Muslims who have converted to Christ, who've gone back into Islam, than have remained Christians. Put your finger on any part of the map, and it will bleed Christian blood. Our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world have been imprisoned and they have cried out to God for deliverance and no angel has come open the gates of the prison. They have prayed, no earthquake came to deliver them. They suffered, they bled, they have died, or even more impressive, they've suffered, they have bled, they have been released, they've gone back into the ministry again. And love endures. Why? Because Christians are macosists and we love to be beaten. Paul's answer to that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He said, Christ's love constrains us. Because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. That deep conviction kept Paul going. It has caused Christians throughout the centuries to endure all kinds of hardship. You look at the life of our Lord. What's most impressive? Not that he turned water into wine. even that he walked on the Lake of Galilee. Uh, What I think was most impressive was that in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what it meant to go to the cross, he could say, if possible, let this cup go, go from me. But nevertheless, not my will, Yours be done. And in saying that, he was going into the darkness. Saying that, he would be separated from the Father for the first time in all eternity. Saying that, he chose suffering over ease. I believe that the greatest anthem of praise the church has ever sung has been in the groans of its martyrs.
It's been the body of its dead. Of those who would not quit. Because they had a faith in Jesus Christ. And they lived for a better world. A better time. We've been doing a strategic plan. We've had several people say we need to have a theology of suffering. I think they're right. But I don't want to know who's going to teach it. Don't give me your academic degrees. Show me your stripes. Show me your wounds. I'm not qualified. But that may be the theology for the 21st century, if we're to endure. (laughs) That's not going to make it as a plank on anybody's campaign. But there's something I'd like to do as we sum up this section. I uh, look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. It talks about uh, love. But I often put my name where love is. And I'd like to do that now lest you sit there and judge me and be unloving. (laughs) I'd like you to put your name there. Haddon Robinson is patient and he is kind. Haddon doesn't envy, doesn't boast. He's not proud. Haddon Robinson isn't rude. He's not self-seeking. He's not easily angered. And he keeps no record of the wrongs done against him. He doesn't delight in evil. But he rejoices wherever truth is found. He always tries to protect always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And again and again and again, I have said, forgive me, but do this work in me. Amen.